Matt Meiser and from the Norman Williams Public Library. And uh, we're very happy to be able to gather in person again. As I was telling the authors, the last events we had here were book stock. And we're still very nervous about gathering in person. We do have a box of masks at the back if you want to um, join me in wearing one. Uh, we are really pleased to be co-hosting this event with Carrie and Christian at the Yankee Bookshop. Um, I was Thank not you. a big mystery reader until the pandemic when they became my go-to mode of diversion and distraction. And I really look forward to discovering some authors and series I haven't yet read. Is this too loud? Okay. Um, the format tonight is going to be fairly straightforward, following a brief introduction of our authors. Our presenters will have the floor, and they are going to have time for Q&A, so if you have a mystery challenge, um, go for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the books that are going to be discussed are set up over here, as you can see, and I'm sure the authors are willing to sign their own books. And um, just so you all know, a portion of the proceeds from this event and other events that we do with authors, um, the Yankee Bookshop donates a portion back to the library in support of what we do. So tonight, Tessa Wegu is the author of the popular Shana Marsh Marchant series, the fourth in the series, A Kind to Kill releases next week. Did you get early copies? Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Early> copies. Um, <laughs> a former freelance journalist and digital marketing strategist, Tessa's work has appeared in Forbes, The Huffington Post, and The Economist. Prior to writing novels, Tessa was the first place winner in the crime category in the 8th Annual Writer's Digest magazine uh, popular fiction award for her short story, Mom's Night Out, which I have yet to read, but I'm really interested in. <laughs> she is co-president of Sisters in Crime in Connecticut and a member of Sisters in Crime in New England as well as New York. And uh, she's a member of the International Thriller Writers and Mystery Writers of America. So she's quite connected with, with, uh, with, with the um, the writers. Tessa grew up in Quebec and now lives with her husband and children in Connecticut where she studies martial arts. <laughs> and Sarah Stewart Taylor is um, most recently the author of three well received Maggie Darcy mysteries. A fourth, A Stolen Child, will be published next June. She is also an author of the four book Sweeney St. George series featuring a young art historian who specializes in gravestone and funerary. Funerary art. Funerary. Funerary. <laughs> In between those two series for adults, Sarah wrote an illustrated adventure series for young readers, The Expeditioners, under the pen name of S.S. Taylor. Sarah grew up in Long Island and was educated at Maryborough College in Vermont and Trinity College, Dublin, where she studied Irish literature. She shares her love of that country through Maggie Darcy's eyes. And um, as a special guest, she will talk about her time in Ireland this coming Saturday here um, at the Friends of Norman Williams Public Library's Holiday Tea. So that's a Saturday afternoon. Sarah has worked as a journalist and writing teacher and now lives with her family on a farm in Vermont where they raise sheep and grow blueberries. And just so you know, there is a sheet um, of the books they're going to talk about if you want to make notes so you remember which is what. Um, as we go down the list. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Liza. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much to all of you for coming out tonight and, uh, and coming to see us. We're, we're, we're really glad to, to be here. We love talking mysteries, so we have a lot to say. <laughs> we do. So I'm going to start out and just tell you a little bit about my series, and then Tessa will do the same. And then we'll jump right into talking about our recommendations. And um, we'll definitely save time for questions and answers. So, um, so yes, feel free. You can ask us anything. Um, so uh, I um, am the author of three books in the Maggie Darcy series. As Liza said, uh, The Drowning Sea is the most recent one. Uh, it came out last June. And this series really came out of um, an experience I had, I suppose you would say, a, a bit of an obsession that I developed while living in Ireland. Um, I lived in Ireland after college for a few years and went to graduate school there. I lived in Dublin. And while I was there, uh, there was a, a very well-publicized um, disappearance of a young American woman who was living in Dublin. 
And in the years after she disappeared, uh, the, the police uh, never really found any leads and, and were never able to find her or to solve that case. Um, and in subsequent years, sadly, there were more disappearances um, of Irish women in the same sort of part of the Dublin mountains where, where this woman had disappeared. And as a young American woman who had just moved to Dublin, um, I had some sort of, I knew some people in common with the woman who had disappeared. And I just had this sort of, I felt this, you know, obviously I, I was out a lot <laughs> hiking on my own and, you know, doing things that perhaps, uh, I have to be careful because my parents are in the audience, but <laughs> perhaps doing things that weren't the safest uh, <laughs> things, things to be doing on my own. And so I just, I had this connection with the case. And um, even after I moved back to the States, I, I followed it. And I, when I started writing mysteries, I really thought about, you know, whether I could use this as, as material, and it just felt, it felt wrong. It didn't feel like I had the right to, to write the story. And it wasn't until many, many years later, really 20 years after, um, after I had left Ireland, that I started to kind of see a way to tell the story. And, and, and my way in was to think about the family members of people who have disappeared and who never get answers to their questions, who never get any closure, never get any sense of, uh, you know, just understanding and being able to kind of wrap their arms around the situation. And so Maggie Darcy is, um, is the cousin of uh, a woman who, who moves to Ireland and disappears. Um, and the, the first novel in the series, The Mountains Wild, which is over on the table, um, it, it is set in two time periods. And in one time period, um, Maggie is a recent college graduate. She's working at her uncle's Irish bar on Long Island when they get a call from the police in Dublin that her cousin has disappeared. And she goes over to see if she can try to figure out what happened. Um, they, you know, not for lack of trying, but they don't find any leads. She never really is able to, to, to get any answers. And then 23 years later, she's the divorced mother of a teenage daughter, and she's working as a homicide investigator, largely because of her experience with her cousin's disappearance. And new evidence is found, and she returns to Ireland to see if she can solve the case once and for all. Um, so, uh, the, the first book in the series really introduces Maggie, and then in the, the second book, um, there's a, a bit of a love interest from the first book, and she gets a case on Long Island involving an Irishman. And in the third book, The Drowning Sea, she's spending the summer uh, on a West Cork Peninsula trying to decide if she and her daughter can move to Ireland uh, to be with this love interest. Um, so. Uh, you know, as, as Liza said, the fourth book in the series comes out in June, and it has Maggie in Dublin um, trying to find a missing toddler. Um, and it was it was really fun to kind of get her back to Dublin and you know give her a really sort of emotional and um, tense case to solve. So that's the Maggie series, um, and now I'll, I'll let Tessa tell us about her series. I can't say enough good things about the Maggie series. I'm a major fan of it. I'm staying with Sarah at her house tonight, and I seriously considered raiding it when she was changing earlier to see if I could find a copy, an early copy of the next book in the series, because I don't, know my if I can computer, wait. But <laughs> I don't know if I can wait any longer, honestly. I'm so excited for it. Um, in my, the origin story of the Shana Merchant series, the most recent of which, well, the paperback of Deadwind actually published today, um, and then the new book, The Kind Kill, will be out next Tuesday. Um, and then the first two books in the series are here as well. The origin story of that series is a little similar in the sense that I also had a personal experience that kind of drove me to want to explore that scenario kind of in the context of a mystery. Um, I had been writing thrillers for a few years, and they all seemed to have uh, something in common, which was a, a component of mystery. To some extent, there was always a mystery woven into those thrillers. Um, and I you know, had an agent for many years and just wasn't able to sell one of these thrillers to a publisher. And then I decided I would try my hand at writing a mystery. And the first thing that came to mind was The Thousand Islands of Upstate New York, because I had experience, personal experience, spending a lot of time there. 
Um, my husband's family has a home on a little three acre island and it's just their home alone on this island. And you have, there's no bridge, you have to take a boat to get there and back. And the very first time that I met his family was on this island. And for whatever reason, instead of just enjoying myself and the family was <laughs> lovely and I had a wonderful time, but the whole time that I was there, I kept thinking, what if there was an emergency of some sort on this <laughs> island? Who would help us? Would the Coast Guard come? Are there yeah. local police? Do they have a boat? I mean, these were all, I think, I guess it's writer mind or writer yeah. brain, but these were all the questions that came to mind. So when years later, as with Sarah, years later, I sat down to write a mystery. This was the location that came to mind, and this was the experience that came to mind. So the first book in the series is called Death and the Family, and it is about a woman who comes to spend the weekend with her new boyfriend's family and he goes missing in the middle of the night and there's blood in the bed but there's no indication that there was any you know sign that he 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 left of his own volition he's just gone but uh when the when the state investigators come to take a look at the situation they one of them believes that it might have been foul play the other one believes that perhaps Maybe it was staged. Maybe he maybe he was involved in staging it because he can be a little bit of a trickster. There's a lot of strange family dynamics going on between the siblings. So that was the book that kicked off the series. And now the fourth book will be coming out very soon. So I'm going to actually kick off my recommendations by talking about the fourth book. Um, I was very lucky. I got a... Um, I got an early read of Tessa's fourth book, The Kind to Kill, and I'm recommending it for, for holiday giving. Um, Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and I would even if I were sitting up here with you. Um, so one of the things that I love so much about, about Tessa's series um, is Shana herself. So in the first book, we meet her when she's in a very, a very vulnerable Place, I think it's fair to say. Definitely. And there's a lot of uncertainty about, about how she's perceiving the things that are happening around her. And as we see her sort of develop through the second book and the third book, um, it's one of the things that I just loved is kind of seeing her come into her own and really, um, really kind of get her power back um, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's how you think of it, but as a reader, that's, that's been one of the real pleasures of this series, to just, you know, to see her both get back to being a competent investigator, but also a sort of more emotionally healthy person. Um, and so in the, in, in the Kind to Kill, we also learn a little bit about what happened to Shana before the events of the first book. We know that something really terrible happened to her. We know uh, very early on in the first book, or probably midway through the first book, that something really terrible has happened to her. And I'm not gonna tell you exactly what it is because I don't wanna ruin the- uh, no, no spoilers <laughs> today. The, the, the surprise of the mystery. But in this book, we learn so much more about what actually happened. It's really satisfying. Um, and then uh, in the midst of a pirate festival, which is something that I didn't even know- Which is a real existed. festival that happens in the Thousand Islands every summer. In the Thousand Islands, um, a woman goes missing. And amidst the sort of the parties and all the kind of hoopla of this festival, Shana and her partner, Tim, um, have to start trying to figure out what happened to this woman. And pretty soon there's a, a really kind of complex mystery that both goes back into Shana's life and background and also into the, the life of this town and, and some of the prominent people in the town. So um, the, the setting is just terrific. I've never been to the Thousand Islands, but I can't wait to go. And, and Tessa just does such a great job of, um, of putting us there and of using the setting to create uh, sort of menace and a real sense of danger within, within the book. So highly, highly recommended. And we should probably mention too, we both write series, but all of the books do work as standalones as well. And I think you can yes, really enter point. the series at any point. You can pick up the fourth book and get up to speed very quickly on what's going on. And then hopefully go back and read the earlier books in the series. Yes, excellent point. Um, so we each have, uh, have five books. And I was just thinking maybe I'll start and then maybe we'll go back and forth so sure. that if you don't just get a big block of me talking. 
Um, all right, so the first one, I'm just gonna go by my pile here. All right, so this is, this book just came out, I think last week or something, it's really, really new, and it's getting a lot of attention. Um, so uh, I, I, uh, will, I will pronounce her name, I think I've got it, I actually looked it up, and I think I've got it right, but forgive me if it's not perfect. Um, Ausma Zahanit Khan, um, is a lawyer and mystery writer uh, who lives in Colorado. And she had written an earlier series set in Canada. Um, her, I think the, the, the detectives were uh, Rachel Getty and, um, the, let's see if it says on the back so I can, no, I'll, I'll find it and, and tell you the name of her other detective. Um, but they, I read one of them and I really, really liked it. She, she really delves into the experience of Muslim Americans and, and Muslim American communities. And so when I heard that she had a new series set in the U.S. Um, in the Denver, Colorado area, I was really excited to, to try it out. And it just, it's one of those books that immediately drops you into a really compelling setting. Like, like Tessa's, um, the way she describes Colorado and this community of, of Blackwater Falls in Colorado, where you have a, a refugee, an immigrant community, you have a mosque that is getting a lot of um, a lot of negative attention from certain elements of the community. Um, you have sort of more traditional Coloradans who um, aren't so sure about these newcomers. There's just all this really wonderful tension, and. Uh, as the book opens, um, her, uh, her new main character, uh, Inaya, uh, is her first name, is working as a community policing officer with the Denver police. So her job is that when there's a, a crime in a, in a Muslim community, she goes in kind of as a liaison to, to try to help the community interface with the police. And of course, she's not very well liked. Uh, for this role, because often when she shows up, it's to criticize the way police have handled things. And so she's, she's, a, she's an outsider. She's not really accepted in, in either community because her own community sees her as a bit of a traitor. And uh, the book opens with the body of a young Syrian uh, woman, uh, girl really, uh, found dead at the mosque in the community. And from there, Inaya and her colleagues have to investigate and try to get to the bottom of what is really going on in this community. Um, there are other young refugee women who have disappeared. And uh, you know, this, the solution is, I, I didn't see it coming. Um, it's really well done. So Blackwater Falls, the first in a new series um, by Asma Zahamit Khan. All right. OK, so thank you, do. Sarah. Um, the first book I will talk about recently came out in paperback. It's The Disinvited Guest by Carol Goodman. Um, I have to be honest, I was a little reluctant to read this book only because it's set during a pandemic, not our mm -hmm. pandemic, a slightly future pandemic, I think 10 years or so into the future. Um, and honestly, I wasn't sure if I was ready to read a pandemic book quite yet, but this is a pandemic book that I really absolutely enjoyed. Um, it's not only a pandemic book. I mean, it really shouldn't even be categorized as that because there's so much more going on. That's just one piece of it, but it's really a locked room mystery. It's set on um, a family's island, actually a little bit similar to, to Death in the Family in my series. Um, and because of the, the looming pandemic, a group of friends decide to go to this island and kind of isolate there together. And while they are there, um, interesting, I think you mentioned something about a, a ghost factor to mm, one of the books. There yeah. is a little bit of that too. It's definitely not paranormal, but there's the suggestion of some sort of paranormal element. Yeah. Um, but really what's so interesting about it is the process that the characters go through as they try to get to know each other. They're, um, they're, they're a group of, of, I guess, acquaintances, really. Some of the friends know each other better and are closer to each other than others. Some of them are related. Um, and, and then there's a caretaker character who comes in and everyone is a suspect when all of a sudden someone turns up dead. So very much along the lines of the um, classic Agatha Christie and then there were none kind of a scenario, mm. um, but with a very clever modern take to it. Uh, and then this pandemic backdrop, which really just creates such a sense of 
urgency and claustrophobia, I really recommend it. It was a wonderful read. Can I add one thing about that book too? Sure. So um, she, I loved it because it really delves into Irish folklore and sort of myth and storytelling. Um, and she gets into the history of the uh, tuberculosis um, quarantines that happened um, and, the sh and the ships that were coming from Ireland and they would quarantine the passengers on the ships uh, as they were coming over after the famine. And it just gets into all this fascinating history of like previous pandemics and quarantines. And you're right. I didn't think I would want to read about it, but it was it was actually really yeah. fascinating and entertaining. And that's a very good point because a part of it is written kind of in letter form or in right. notebook journal form. And so you do, there is a bit of a historical mystery element to it, even though it's set actually in the near future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really good. All right, so my next one, um, probably Anne Cleves is familiar to lots of you mystery readers. Um, so I, you know, her books come out in September every year. That's kind of her slot in the publishing calendar. But I always wish that they came out in November because my favorite thing to do is to sit down with an Anne Cleves, a new Anne Cleves, when the new one comes out, um, by a roaring fire <laughs> and just, you know, get really cozy and settle in with, the, with her characters. Um, for those of you who may not have read Anne Cleves yet, she has three series, two that are ongoing. Um, the Vera Stanhope series, uh, which this is the latest one in that series. Um, and then she has the Jimmy Perez series, which is set in the Shetland Islands of Scotland. Um, and it is a television series that probably some of you have seen. Um, and then the Matthew Venn series, which is her new one. She's only written two of those, but I, I love that series as well. Um, but you know, there's something about Vera. Um, she's just, I just love Vera. She's quirky. She's odd. Uh, she's brilliant. And in The Rising Tide, she's investigating suicide also on an island. I don't know. We've got a little bit of an <laughs> thing going here bit today. Of an island <laughs> thing going on. Um, so uh, she's investigating a, a suicide amongst a group of friends who go back to this island every five years to sort of have a reunion. And she learns that uh, early on in, in this tradition, um, one of their number, one of their friends, uh, was killed when the causeway to the island flooded and her car was on it. And yet they continue to come back every five years until this suicide happens. And of course, Vera isn't sure it's a suicide and she, she turns out to be right. Um, and she has to investigate the old death and the relationships between these friends. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's Vera, it's uh, Joe and Holly, her sort of trusty uh, fellow detectives. Um, and I just, I really recommend it. In front of a fire with some hot cider or hot chocolate <laughs> on a cold day. I'll have to pick that one up myself. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about The Damage by Caitlin Ware, which I would say veers a little bit more into thriller territory, um, not in a graphic, violent type of way, um, maybe verges on suspense as well, but just in terms of the, there's no real, well, there's a little bit of a mystery going on, but really it's about family dynamics. It's about dealing with a very tense, stressful um, polarizing situation. So it's a, it's about a family in Massachusetts. Um, the, old, the, the wife is a lawyer, a community lawyer. The husband um, has a younger brother who's in his 20s, and he's kind of always been a father figure to this, this much younger brother. Um, the younger brother is sexually assaulted at a bar, but the circumstances around the assault are very nebulous. They're, they were on a date, no one is really sure who's telling the truth about what happened, um, but the the wife uh, gets involved trying to help her her brother-in-law um, get through this situation, especially when the courts become involved. So it's just a really wonderful character study. Um, it looks at assault from a different point of view because in, in you know in many thrillers it's the woman who's assaulted. It's often a young woman who's assaulted, but in this case it's a young man. So it 
it really delves kind of into into um, perceptions that we may you know have as a society and as a, as a culture and judgments that are made against young homosexual men so um, I would highly recommend this one if you have someone maybe on your holiday list who enjoys suspense thrillers um, really family dynamic type of character driven stories I've heard great things about that. Yeah, it's wonderful. It was a debut. It was this author's debut mm -hmm. uh, last year, I believe. Great. So my next recommendation is, this is the first one in the series, but I, I'm actually recommending the whole, the whole series. Um, so I usually pride myself on always reading the book first. <laughs> I, I, I won't go see the movie. I won't watch the TV show if I haven't read the book first. But I broke my my usual pledge with, with this one. Um, somebody, it's funny, I knew, I knew a little bit about, I'd heard of Mick Heron, but I hadn't read any of these books. And someone said, you have to watch this series on, on Apple TV called Slow Horses. It's just so entertaining and great, you'll love it. And I did, and my husband loved it, and you know, my kids even loved it. We all really had fun watching it together. So then of course I went and I, read most of the books now and they are just terrific they're like a, a separate pleasure from the show but just equally as good so slow horses um is uh it's set in a, a, a building that's referred to as slough house in london and it's where uh mi5 agents um who have screwed up <laughs> go <laughs> because of course they can't be fired right because they're spies and so they can never be fired so they're sent to this to this building and they're supervised by uh, a once great spy who has had some sort of downfall that in the first book we don't really understand um, and his name is Jackson Lamb and he he's just like one of the greatest characters uh, you know who I've read lately he's sloppy he's crude He's mean, and yet he's also somehow completely endearing, and you'll kind of fall in love with him. Um, and you and you learn about all of these these <laughs> spies who, for one reason or another, have ended up at Slough House. And of course, even though they're supposed to just get grunt work, they end up often, you know, having to save the day. And and each each book really is about how these you know, the worst of the worst end up, you know, saving the day for MI5. Um, so I would, I would just highly recommend them. They're, and they're really funny. Um, they're really engagingly written. Uh, there, are, there are moments of real sort of literary flight, I think, of these. Um, and then moments of just laugh out loud humor. Did you say that's the first in the series? So this is the first in the series. Um, and the, the series uh, that the first season of the series is essentially based on this book. But, you know, it's, it's worth reading and it's worth watching as well. That's another one for my list. Um, this is a historical mystery, Clark and Division. Um, it's set in, I believe, 1944. It's about a Japanese-American family um, who moves to Chicago and they, um, have a history with having been uh, incarcerated after the events of Pearl Harbor. And now they are finally trying to kind of rebuild their lives. And they have two daughters, one of whom is kind of a more traditional, um, a traditional loyal to her heritage uh, young woman. And then they have a second daughter who is much more rebellious and kind of uh, um, creates problems for the family. Um, and for the and for the culture as well. So the the older daughter moves to Chicago in advance of the family to kind of scope things out as they're kind of rebuilding their lives. And uh, the day before the rest of the family comes to join her, she is discovered to have been killed by a subway train, um, by a, an L train on the L tracks. So the family arrives and the younger sister starts to ask around the community um, where they've already, the older sister had already kind of found some 
uh, community members and a, and a place for them, other Japanese American community members that they could kind of, that would kind of embrace them in, in their new home in Chicago. And what ends up happening is these members of the community tell the younger sister that perhaps this death was not an accident. So it's very much a mystery, um, really, really engaging, and also not a subject matter that I think we hear too much about, um, and not a point of view that we hear too much about in fiction either. Um, I lived in Chicago for eight years, so for me or anyone who happens to love a Chicago, love Chicago as much as I do, I really enjoyed getting you know a historical look at what the city was like during that time as well. Um, it's all very accurately drawn. So for the historical mystery lover on your list, this is an excellent a choice. It won so many awards, I don't even think I could possibly yeah. keep track. And it, it won and was nominated awards. for many, many awards. So yeah, really wonderful choice. Great, I'm excited. I haven't read that one yet. I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and actually, I think this is a great moment to say too that I, you know, I, 20 years ago when I was first publishing mysteries, um, there wasn't a lot of diversity in the, in who was writing mysteries and who mysteries were about and where they were set. And over the last, I would say like the last 10 years, there's just been this amazing explosion of, uh, you know, new, new mystery writers um, who are writing about characters who we just haven't haven't heard about before and it's really wonderful there's so many good ones to, to discover out there yeah. um, so and you know I, I always say that like the more we read them and the more we buy them the more of them we'll get <laughs> so um, I think it's good you know it's good to, to think about that when we're when we're choosing, when we're choosing exactly. and my, so my next one um, is also a historical mystery um, so this is another one that's getting a lot of attention. Um, it's called Anywhere You Run by Wanda Morris. And this is her second book. Uh, her first one, I think, came out a couple of years ago and, and was also well received, but this one's really making waves. So this is set in 1964, um, the summer of 1964 in Mississippi, um, which as, as you probably remember was uh, the Freedom Summer, um, the Voting Project Summer. And this book uh, follows two young black women who are in various ways involved with uh, the events of that summer and with the, with the murders of the three um, young civil rights ad activists who, who were murdered in Mississippi that summer. And it, it's, I just, I, I love the way that Wanda Morris, you know, I mean, it's such a huge subject and it's been written about so much. And I love the way that she found her way into it. I think that's one of my favorite things about this book. It's not a traditional mystery. It operates probably actually more like a thriller, although there is a mystery to be solved. But it, um, the voices are those of two young women, sisters. Their names are Violet and Marigold. Um, and Violet, when we meet her, is fleeing Mississippi because she's killed someone. And we don't know exactly who or why for a little bit. Um, her sister Marigold is working for the Summer Voting Project and um, finds herself unexpectedly and um, uh, um, <laughs> she, she doesn't want to be pregnant. And so she's, all, so the two of them are both sort of in trouble in different ways. and flee Mississippi through Jim Crow South to try to make a new life, to try to save their lives. And it, it's, just, um, it's just really, really well done. And their voices are so strong and so, uh, so singular. And the characters really just jump off the page. And it's one of those books that there are all these different threads and you're not sure where she's going with it and how they're gonna come together and they, do come together at the end. You know, they kind of collide at the end. Um, so, Wanda Morris, Anywhere You Run. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Ruth Ware. She wrote The Woman in Cabin 10. She wrote One by One. She's had many mysteries over the last few years. This is her most recent. Um, it is set in London, and it's, uh, if some of you are familiar with the term dark academia, I would say this book falls into that category. It flips back and forth between present day where you have a young woman who is um, pregnant and she and her husband are just 
you know, embracing the pregnancy and the experience, but she also has this history. The, the two of them met first at um, Oxford, and as she is going through this pregnancy and kind of becoming closer with her husband in, in different ways, um, they kind of, they, they discover that someone who, how do I say this without spoilers? I don't want to give anything away with this one. They, they discover that someone who was um, charged with a crime that occurred at Oxford while they were also at Oxford has died. And it kind of brings that, the whole case and their experience that the, the murder victim was someone they were very close to. It kind of brings the whole experience to the surface again for them while they're going through this, this pregnancy and causes a lot of stress for, for the young woman who, um, of course, you know, it wants to be taking care of herself due to the pregnancy. And what ends up happening is you have kind of a dual timeline where you're with her and her husband in present day um, going through the pregnancy, but then you also have these flashbacks to what really happened with this murder years ago. And it becomes clear that perhaps the person who was charged with the crime and has been serving time all, all these years is not the one who was truly responsible, which then all of a sudden opens the door to questions about which member of the friend group may it have been. And so the murder victim is an it girl. She is a young woman from a very wealthy background who everyone seems to adore. She's one of these people that everything kind of goes right for until she winds up dead. And there's actually a locked room component to this one as well because she is found dead in in a room um, similar to a traditional locked room mystery where it, it's not at all apparent how the, the murder could have possibly happened based on the situation with the room, the witnesses or lack thereof. So it's interesting um, from that perspective as well because it, it's a very unique take on a locked room mystery. It's not at all the, um, and then there were none kind of formula um, with you know a traditional, let's say an island, which is very much along the lines of what happens in Death in the Family. This has a locked room component to it, but it's really much more about um, the young woman and her husband trying to solve this, this murder that everyone was so sure had already been solved. Mm, that's great. Yeah, very atmospheric as well. A lot of um, rainy London days in this book. <laughs> and then of course the, the uh, Oxford atmosphere too. Well, I have some more atmosphere uh, to recommend. Um, so this is also another historical mystery. Um, the Winter Guest by W.C. Ryan is, um, this is one of my favorite books of the year, actually. I really recommend this. Um, you know, it's right up my alley. It's, it's Irish history. It's set during the Irish Civil War. Um, it's set on the Atlantic coast in a big old uh, falling down house that may or may not be haunted. Um, and it really delves into that period of Irish history. So after the Irish War of Independence, um, when the, the island fought a civil war over, um, over the treaty. And it really gets into kind of the, you know, how, how during the civil war, it really was neighbors against neighbors, and in some cases, brothers against brothers. Um, so the book opens, um, with the murder of a young Anglo-Irish woman, so the daughter of the, the landed gentry, uh, who has become a revolutionary and and was a you know fought uh, as 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 much as women could in the Irish War for Independence, um, and she's you know sort of loosely based on um, Countess Markowitz and Maud Gunn, and you know she, she, he's definitely using all of that uh, parts of Irish history. So she is, is, we see her murdered at, at the very beginning of the book, and we, but we don't know who did it. And it turns out that her family was killed in a botched IRA raid. And she was pulled alive from the car where her family was, was killed and was taken back to her house. And it was only after that that someone came in and murdered her. And so, um, the IRA sends a young intelligence officer named Tom Harkin, who just also happens to have been uh, the murdered woman's fiance, um, to go to the house and to go undercover and try to figure out who murdered her, because they need to know if they have 
uh, you know, spies or a mole, a mole or someone who's committing, uh, you know, committing treason or betraying the IRA in the ranks. And uh, Harkin is uh, a veteran of the First World War. He actually fought for Britain in the First World War and then came home to Ireland. Um, and that was a, you know, that was a common situation. And so he's this sort of in-between character. And um, he has very serious PTSD. And so he, he sees things and he hears things. And we're not sure if the house is haunted or if it's all in his head. And it's just wonderfully done. And there's terrible weather, <laughs> lots of rain, <laughs> lots of mist. Uh, the ocean pounding at the cliffs and this old house that's falling in and lots of Irish history. So The Winter Guest by W.C. Ryan, um, I highly recommend. And he actually wrote an, his book before this, um, which I can't remember the title, but I'll, I can find it, um, is an island murder mystery. Um, so you, you can see there's a, a, I think there's been a resurgence of interest in some of those Agatha Christie tropes um, that are so delicious, especially this yeah. time of year, I think. That's very true. It does seem like over the last few years there have, has been this influx of locked room mysteries, but everyone is putting a, a fresh spin on them and a modern take, you know, on a very traditional, classic approach to to um, structuring a mystery story. Yeah. So, and yeah. islands seem to be very in right so that's great. Um, before we open up to questions, I'll just yeah, speak really quickly too. about Edwin Hill's The Secrets We Share. Um, this is a book that came out, I believe, in March of this year. Edwin Hill has a wonderful mystery series called the Hest Hester Thursby series, which is fantastic, um, uh, set in Boston. And this is also set in Boston, but this is a, a standalone, his very first standalone. Um, and it is about two sisters, one of whom is a detective, a homicide detective, and the second sister is kind of a baking influencer. She has a baking blog. She's mm -hmm. about to publish a, a book. She's very popular. Um, the sisters really don't have that much in common. However, they both share this traumatic experience from their past. Their father, when they were quite young, was found dead behind, in the woods behind their house murdered and they think um, a little similar to the it girl they everyone thinks they know who the killer was but all these years later in the days leading up to the influencer sister's book launch she starts to receive messages um an anonymous messages that seem to suggest that someone may know more about their father's murder than they're letting on um, and of course, because she's, she's close, personally involved with the situation, the sister who's a homicide detective decides to get involved with the case and help her sister figure out who's sending the notes. Um, this one also has a, a flavor of a thriller, I would say. It's a very quick read. Um, whenever I recommend this book to someone, I always say that it's, it's for the, the lovers of the twist. This book has so many twists that my head was spinning. <laughs> and some of the twists in a less experienced author's hands, I think might not work. Yeah. But Edwin is just such an excellent writer that at, by the end of it, I just was flabbergasted. I mean, honestly, I sat there for many minutes after finishing this book trying to figure out how I didn't see those twists coming and and trying to talk almost trying to talk myself out of them and convince myself that they weren't possible but they are they are because he does such a great job yeah so that's the secrets we share and his, uh, Edwin's Hester Thursby series is about a librarian so Hester is a librarian that's right so. it's very important to mention <laughs> Great. So, yeah, so what questions do you all have? We're happy to talk about anything. And yeah. if, you have, if, if you have gifts you're trying to find for mystery lovers on your list and you're not sure what to get them, we can give you some suggestions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is actually from my grandson. Mm -hmm. I want to know about every another expedition. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's a great, I want to know the answer to that question too. I, you know, <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. He got his whole, a couple years ago, Fourth grade class. His teacher had to go out and get the books. And oh my gosh, that's so sweet. A, I loved so writing the. I loved writing those books. And you know, it was what happened was I lost my publisher, and so 
we, you know, I had written the third one, so I self-published the third one, but it was so much work to self-publish and to kind of do all that myself that I sort of said, I, you know, I want to write the next one, but until I can find a publisher who, to publish it, I'm, I'm going to hold off. So that's sort of what I'm holding off for. But I, you know, I really miss, I loved writing those books and I loved going out and talking to the classes of kids and talking to kids about writing and reading. And it was, you know, it was really fun. So tell him, I'm hoping, I'm, I have my fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> Maybe not in time for this holiday. Maybe season. not for Christmas, <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Speed readers, or uh, if you have heard from authors, it takes forever to write a book. How do you get an opportunity to read so many other authors, or is that part of what you need to do for your own stories? Yeah, it's yes. hard. It's yeah. so hard. It's so important to to read because you know I think I think for, for anyone who writes fiction, like we're re we were readers first. And that's what made us want to write. And so it's so important to, to read. And I find if I'm stuck, um, you know, often going and reading a lot of books by people I admire is a great way to get unstuck. Um, and so I, it is really important to read. But it's hard to find the time because, you know, when you're, a, both of us are writing a book a year at this point. So it's, you know, it, it's hard to find the time. Um, it's important. I find when I'm, you know, I have like different phases of writing. So when I'm like really, really like trying to get a draft done, I actually don't read very much. I kind of just write all the time. But then when I'm between drafts, that's when I find windows to read. How about you? I, um, yes, similar situation, but I, I try to read a little bit all the time because it's yeah. just so much a part of my routine, I guess, you know, I always read before bed. So even though if I'm actively drafting one of my own books, it might take me a very long time to get through reading someone else's book because I only have a little, you know, snatch of time here and there to do it. Um, I do find that I have become a much faster reader yeah. over the years. I think because we have to read our own work so many times, yeah. <laughs> you know, and often we don't have, we're not necessarily given that much time to do, let's say a revision or to read through yeah. the the proofreading um, final copy of a manuscript. So I've gotten faster at reading and um, I, I try, I mean, I think I try to keep a list on Goodreads of everything that I read to, to keep track of it. Mm -hmm. Some of it is, I think Sarah would agree, we want to support our, really our colleagues. We want to support our peers, right? right? And we want to see what they're doing. Yep. Um, which is one of the reasons why I always gravitate towards Sarah's books. But then the other thing is we just find a series that we love right. or we find an author style that we absolutely love. And so of course we're going to try as, as Sarah said, we're, re we're readers first and we, we started that way. And that's, you know, still so much a part of our DNA that it's really hard to, <laughs> I find it really hard to focus only on my own writing because I, I really find that I miss reading other yeah. authors work when yeah. I do that. And there's so much, there's so much good stuff out there. I mean, I, and I, I love reading mysteries, but I like reading a lot of other things as well. And so I read, you know, I read a lot of non-crime fiction and I actually really enjoy reading non-fiction. Um, I'm right now I'm reading, uh, Garrett Graff's giant Watergate book. I don't know. Has anybody, has anyone else read it? It's terrific. Um, it's really, really good. It's just, it's meaty. It's so well researched and he, uh, he, he just does this incredible job of drawing all of the characters from Watergate as though they were, you know, as though they were characters in a novel. You know, I mean, Richard Nixon, I, you know, I've never, I never thought that I would find Richard Nixon fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and he really is. I mean, he's just like, he's full of contradictions and um, it's, it, it's, it's, I highly recommend it. So yeah, so that's, it's hard because, uh, you know, I don't, just want to read mysteries, but there's so there's so many to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you set a, t a special you know, a time each day when you write, or is it just when you feel like writing? Or... It's um, for me. It's yeah. I mean, I have to. It really has to be a job. You know, I have to. I sit down generally from you know like eight to three every day, 
and I am writing during those, and that's the only way I can write a book a year. Yeah, same with me. I really need to do it while the kids are at school, otherwise it's just chaos in my house and I won't get anything done. Um, when I'm really deep into a manuscript, like let's say during the drafting process and I'm on a deadline, um, I will not only do that, but I'm sure same for you, but I'll try to find any free moment that I can. So sometimes that means staying up very late at night. Sometimes that means waking up at five to get more writing done, you know, before the kids wake up for school. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a very good point about treating it like a job because I always thought before I, before I started writing novels and certainly before I was published, I always thought that there was, you know, there's this whole, um, theory or whatever about a muse and I always thought that published authors would light a candle and just kind of draw the shades the words come. just right. be inspired and I mean really the, the fact of the matter is that often is not the way that it pans out no. mm -hmm. and when you're on deadline and you have a publisher you know a contract and a publisher waiting for that next manuscript you really have to yeah. find a way to make it happen, even if there is no muse that day. And even if you don't feel inspired, you just have to sit down and bang out, you know, however many words you need to write that day in order to stay on track. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, I, I found it very freeing when I realized that in order to write something the right way, I first had to write it the wrong way, <laughs> you know? And so it, that took a little bit of the pressure off, I think. Um, you know, that you, even if you're not feeling inspired, even if you're not exactly sure what you're doing, you just got, you got to sit down and you just have to write something because until you write it the wrong way, you're not going to figure out how to write it the right way. And so that it is very, that's very much kind of the approach of like, you just, you sit down and you put something on the screen and, um, you know, probably you'll change a lot of it later, but at least you're, you know, you're in the process. Yeah, you can't edit a blank page. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Speaking of editing at the post, uh, when you did the book, they always uh, just fall over the place. I couldn't cut them out. I edit them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Does the editor just wait until you send something in and they say, no, that's not this way, do it that way? Or are, how critical are they? Why don't you go first? I think it depends very much on the editor. I think all editors have a slightly different style. Um, I've worked with two different editors, three different editors to, to, to this point, um, and they definitely all take a, slump, a somewhat different approach, but in pretty much in all cases, um, there will be this collaboration that happens right at the very beginning when I write an outline or a synopsis of, of the idea that I have um, for the story and then I'll work with them a little bit and they might have some changes, they might have some suggestions. The interesting thing is the final product often is miles Very away from what that right. initial outline and synopsis is, yeah. but we try to get on the same page early on before I actually start writing because you don't necessarily want to have that conversation when you're 200 pages into the manuscript and right. then you discover it's not what your editor is looking for. Yeah, and then there is it's a it's a very collaborative process all the way through too. I mean, once I once I have a very polished draft, something that honestly I would feel pretty comfortable putting out in the marketplace, um, I send it to my agent. Well, I send it to a bunch of beta readers and then incorporate their feedback, and then I send it to my agent for her feedback, and then it goes to the editor, and invariably the editor will have some thoughts as well. Um, and then there will be a little bit of back and forth and I'll just, you know, keep working on the manuscript from there until we come up with something that is, that we're both really comfortable and happy with. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar. I mean, I've, I've had different experiences with different editors, but there, yeah, there's usually like a little bit of flurry of collaboration at the beginning, um, you know, just so that they know, you know, that I'm writing a mystery and not a science fiction novel or something, you know, <laughs> they want to know what it is. And then I really am kind of alone with the book for, you know, eight or nine months. And I get it to a place where I think I'm ready to send it to first to my agent and then to the editor. And then she'll have a lot of feedback. My editor usually writes me like you know, 10 page, single spaced typed um, editorial letters uh, with just lots and lots of feedback. And so then I'll go in and do a big revision 
and send it to her again. And hopefully at that point, she kind of says, okay, I think we're, we're ready to go to copy edits. And then the copy editor does a whole other round of editing. And copy editors are like geniuses. I mean, I don't, you, you wouldn't believe the things that they catch in people's novels. Like every single one of these published novels probably in copy edits had you know, major timeline issues yeah. where like something happens on Saturday and then suddenly it's Tuesday the next day, you know, like that's so common. Um, they catch that, they catch if your character has blue eyes on page 20 and brown eyes on page 21, you know, um, their copy editors are the best. Um, yeah. And then proofreaders, and then there's a final round of proofreading, which is just a really like, you know, Missing commas. Typos. Yeah, typos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So by the time it gets to market, a lot of a lot of hands have touched that manuscript in various yeah. ways. And still, there are tons of mistakes that make it into yeah. publishing books. <laughs> I mean, every author I know has had that experience of standing up in front of, a, you know, doing a reading from a book, and they're reading aloud, and, and they stop because there's a typo on you know, page 10. Or whatever. And I'm sure bookstore owners sometimes hear about yeah. <laughs> when people come back and say, there's a typo in this book. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that that can happen. But, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is everyone is looking at so many different projects yeah. all at once. And I think if you're reading the same, I mean, this for the same reason that we need fresh eyes to look at our yeah. work. If you're, even those fresh eyes, I mean, at some point they've read it multiple times. So things occasionally slip through the cracks and you hope that's not going to be the case, but it's not impossible, right? Yeah. I mean, we're yeah. human. <laughs> we're all human. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, sure. Okay. I, here, okay. uh, we'll do you and then I'll get uh, you uh, done. Okay. I often <laughs> wonder, do you ever worry that you're going to be second guessed by your reader? I mean, I Oh, yes. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> you would have solved that murder right. overnight. Or where was the policeman's body camera? Right. Come yeah. On. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, pol the d we both write police procedural series. So our main characters are, you know, professional investigators with existing law enforcement entities. So in your case, it's the, the state of New York mm -hmm. uh, Depart Bureau, Bureau of Criminal, Criminal Investigation. Investigation. Yeah. And in my case, it's it's Ireland's mm -hmm. National Police Force, which is called the Garda Shekana. And, you know, I, I mean, I talked to I talked to retired uh, Gardaí in, in Ireland. I asked them questions, I, you know, because it's so important to get it right. And I know you do a lot of yeah, that I have well. um, my. I have a lot of investigators that I speak with that all work up there in the area. But the but the biggest resource for me and the mo and the most valuable resource is the actual sheriff of Jefferson County up in the Thousand Islands where the series is set. Um, and I was lucky to connect with her early on when I was drafting the first book, Death in the Family. Mm -hmm. And she is my go-to. I send her emails all the time with questions. And it's funny because, you know, four books into the series, and there is a, a kind of serial killer throughout the series who eventually follows Shayna Merchant up to the Thousand Islands. And it's come to the point now where some of the questions that I ask this lovely sheriff, she just writes me back and says, I'll be honest with you, we don't get many serial killers up in these parts, so I'm not entirely sure how we would treat this particular situation. But she, you know, does her best to try to brainstorm ideas to make it yeah. as authentic as possible. But Stupid. yeah, I mean, especially I think when you have, when you're dealing with real life locations, yeah. which is the reason why a lot of authors will change the name yeah. of the town, let's say where their story is set. Um, but when you're dealing with with actual locations, it's really important to get those facts right because the locals know. And They'll they tell, will you. tell you if you get it wrong. They will <laughs> tell you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. What was your, what was your question? Um, so, as you're, when you're thinking about a new series, like, do you come up first with the location, or is it a character, or is it a twist? Like, what, what do you, what grabs you first? What, how about you? Um, well, with this series, it was really the location. I knew for sure because I had spent so much time in the Thousand Islands, and I always had thought that that would be a great place to set a really atmospheric mystery story. Um, you know, that was where I, that was my starting 
point, I knew I wanted to mostly be set on an island, an isolated island. And I knew that I wanted there to be a storm that kind of cut everyone off from, you know, getting help from the local police and kind of from civilization. So that was where I began. But then also the primary character, the protagonist, Shana Merchant, who's the state police investigator, she was also a big part of it. And I just had this idea of, I wanted there to be this very driven, um, kind of hard as nails, female investigator type of character who also had a very vulnerable side. And, and her vulnerability is that she too has PTSD because of this traumatic experience that Sarah alluded to earlier that she had in New York when she was with the NYPD before moving upstate. So um, yeah, I guess for me it was, I mean, really atmosphere and location and setting are where I start every book. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing is character. Now with a series, once you have so many of the recurring characters, it makes things a little bit easier. So now it's really just me looking at where do I want this next book to be set? And then yeah. trying to determine from there, what aspects of this setting can I you know, dig into somehow? So it's a lot about culture. It's a lot about community. Uh, it's a lot about the history of the area. And that's where I start to dig to see what kind of story might be kind of buried in there. Yeah, setting is so important. Um, I think, you know, the series definitely began with Ireland um, and a little bit with, you know, with the circumstances of a disappearance um, and then working around that to figure out, okay, who are these people and how do they get here and how, what's their relationship to each other? Um, but, you know, for me, I think setting is really, both in my writing and my reading, um, my favorite books are books that have these really just unique and well-drawn settings and the people who are, are, you know, make up the universe of the book are really like of the place and, um, you know, you just you kind of feel like they couldn't live anywhere else. That's kind of my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Can you expand a little bit on the fact that you can jump into a five-book series and not really feel like you read the last chapter first. Do you see what I'm getting at? I, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think it's interesting because I think with your new book, you really could jump in. Like, you, you, it's written in a way that you really could just jump in and read and read this book. Mm -hmm. You know, and it would, be, it would be nice to go back and read the other ones, but you don't have to. Um, with my series, I, you know, I mean, I don't want to scare people off from <laughs> buying later the later books as a standalone, but I do think like th there are some things that happen in the first book that are really, um, it, you know, it's a little confusing, and it if you were to read a later book, it would kind of spoil the the twist of the first book in a sense, and so I usually do recommend that people start with my first book. Um, yes, but, spoilers yeah. are a very good point. I mean, you do yeah. run the risk if you jump into a series, you know, midway through of spoilers yeah. because you definitely will always get the, the best experience as a reader starting at the beginning of a series. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky writing a series because as Sarah said, we don't want to scare people off. Right. And some people don't necessarily want to commit to reading, you know, especially if the series right. is 10 books or something like that. So. Um, I think both of us, and I'm sure all series authors would say, we try to write them in a way where you get enough information that maybe if you don't have the full backstory, which you wouldn't if you jumped into, let's say, the third or fourth book, you have enough information that you can enjoy the book. Right. But in a perfect world, you'd start at the beginning. Yeah. It, it always sort of bothers me when when I have to do the like recap, you know, yeah, it's difficult. And it's, it's difficult to do it in a way that doesn't feel really cheesy where it's like, you know, Jennifer, who just last year had been assaulted and had solved a mystery with, you know, and you, yeah. it, it just feels really stilted and kind of, you know, but if you don't do it, you, then your readers can be confused. So it's a, it's a tricky thing. Well, even, you know, readers who have been with us throughout the series, if we're only coming out with the book a year or it's been several right, months in between, you know, since the last book, they might forget. So yeah. that recap is important. It can be important. Yeah. Yeah. But you also don't want to go into too much detail to bore the people who have read the previous books who already know all this stuff. Right. So yeah. it's a fine line, I guess. <laughs> it is. But yeah, no, it's a good question. Yeah. Well, I think we'll continue the conversation more informally 
and you could well this wonderful display of books. I can't wait to get my hands on some of them. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tessa and Sarah, for Thank you sharing so your Thank you so much. reading habit with us. And um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.